This is one of the great centers of neuroimaging and informatics in the world. I'm the director of the Mark and Mary Stevens Institute for Neuroimaging and Informatics. Our goal is to understand how the brain works when it's healthy and what goes wrong when it's diseased. We do this by applying imaging techniques and combining them with other observations. This is a great for not only developing the technology in terms of image acquisition, understanding how to visualize data, understanding the genetics, understanding the disease process. It requires mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, as well as neurobiologists and clinicians. Not only a multidisciplinary institute, we have the expertise, but also the resources. It's an example of a specially built facility to accommodate a special type of science. The Laboratory of Neuroimaging has been a pioneer in many things. For example, we were among the first to understand the trajectory of brain maturation as it occurs from uh, young children all the way through adolescence. The first to look at how drugs that are used to treat AIDS affect brain tissue. We have applied these techniques to create wiring diagrams in health and disease. We mapped Alzheimer's disease over time and related that to cognitive measures prior to anybody else. We can look inside the human brain, looking at its anatomy and its physiology without interfering with its normal function. We can create multi-site projects where the data are collected across laboratories, across countries even. And we can combine them and relate them in ways that were unimaginable only a short time ago. That achievement has enabled us to pose questions that were unheard of before. It has increased the pace of discovery beyond anybody's wildest imagination. And it has immediately been translated into the care and treatment of patient populations. My focus is really trying to understand what is going on in the brain of people who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. We have made great advances in heart disease, cancer, where we've actually been able to reduce the number of deaths associated with these diseases, but not with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is perhaps one of the biggest problems we face today. The odds are about one in three if we reach the age of 85 years. Currently in the U.S., there's 5 million people living with Alzheimer's disease. These numbers will triple by the year 2050. Now we can actually use brain imaging to view the Alzheimer's pathology in the living human brain. Think of the following vignette. You show up in a clinic and you have a complaint about your nervous system. A scan could be collected about you, an MRI scan, and that could be compared in a database electronically to hundreds of thousands of other examples and used as a diagnostic aid by the clinician to fully understand where you belong in that population. So this becomes an enormously powerful mechanism to assist the physician to understand what's going wrong with you, but also to help guide the selection of various interventions. And so by combining this research, collection of databases, and moving it into the clinic, we've really enhanced the care and treatment of individuals as well as populations. One of the goals of our institute is to aggregate the largest set of brain images across the world. And through really trying to pursue big data, we'll start to make even more discoveries. The combination of databases and imaging is enormously powerful. And that's happening in the field of Alzheimer's disease research more than almost any other area. Perhaps because we recognize the importance and the emergency of it. So we started this program called GAIN, which really is a global interactive network which describes Alzheimer's disease data that's been collected independently for different projects around the world. The reason you want to do this is the statistical power that's necessary to understand the complexities of this devastating disease requires vast numbers of observations. So we had to get the data from 
all kinds of projects, literally to accumulate half a million or even a million patients who have been fully characterized using imaging, genetics, all kinds of things. These studies have been going on anywhere from five to 15 years. And so you can imagine from studies like this that multiple data sets and, and time points have been collected for many subjects. In order to combine brains, we have to have the mathematical approaches that can put them into the same space in a way where we understand what we've done to make them equivalent. We want to reduce that problem as much as possible. So when we create multi-site project, we have to accommodate not only the individual biological variability, but the way in which they collected the data. Whether the instrument they use, the particular scanner that they used, can produce the same kind of images as somebody else's scanner. And so there's a great deal of effort to try to harmonize these data, to make it so they can be aggregated. By using a really well curated, or meaning a data set that we've vetted, we've now aggregated data all over the country and even in other parts of the world to look at common features that we can examine across data sets to see really on a large scale what are the patterns and the relationships. We want to make observations using every tool at our disposal. Imaging is one of those things that has just opened up the vista of neuroscience more than perhaps any other technology. The complexity of the brain is one of the grandest challenges that we face in terms of discovery about who we are. These challenges are going to be met in stages. It's much like mapping anything, that the initial maps are relatively easy to come by. We can identify the lobes of the brain, for example. We can identify certain sulci or certain regions and nuclei. But getting down into the nuances, that's the difficult part, neuronal activity, the activity of the nerve cells while you're performing a task. We can't see that using MRI. Instead, we measure secondary phenomena. As neurons are active, they demand extra nutrients, and those are delivered via blood. There is a signal from the neuron to adjacent blood vessels that causes the vessel to dilate. It gets bigger, and more blood will go into that region in response to the neuronal demand as the neurons fire more frequently, they need more energy. More red blood cells are delivered to this region. So we're actually measuring changes in blood flow when neurons are active. We look at genetic mutations in Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism. We even look at genetic mutations that help us stratify normal populations. Why are some people good at one thing versus another? by looking at the genotype-phenotype relationship in vast populations, can we fully understand the relationship? Genes work in an environment. Some of the environment is in our head. Some of it's in the city that we live in. Trying to understand the genotype-phenotype relationship in humans is difficult because we've had a long evolutionary history and there's been a great deal of variability. Other species can tell us a great deal about that relationship between genes and the structure of brain or the function of brain because we share a great many genes with other animals. And so we can manipulate these animals, mice typically, uh, to have the same mutation that has been found to be associated with a disease in humans. One of the projects that we have uh, at our institute is called the Mouse Connectome Project. And this is a project where we're tracing the connectivity between different regions of the brain in the mouse. And so this will provide a full wiring diagram of this animal. The connectome requires that we use very sophisticated pulse sequences to gather this data, and very sophisticated algorithms to compute what we call a tractogram, showing you the connections between different regions of the brain. And these are tremendously advantageous when trying to understand a particular disease process with a level of detail we cannot obtain in life in humans. The human connectome is one of the most interesting things now possible. We can use a particular type of imaging called diffusion imaging to create signals in MRI that allow us to trace what regions are connected to what other regions. We can now create a connectome 
of a human being and relate that to a person who has a disease and look at a connectopathy. So this would be a change in the wiring of an individual that has a particular disease. The INI has been a pioneer in the development of algorithms for understanding connectivity in the brain. We've developed a whole suite of approaches that map these connections in exquisite visual detail, allowing us to not only see these, but quantitate their differences. And that's an important requirement in terms of understanding the differences between populations or even between individuals. The Institute has a role to play in education. It's part of our mission. Training the next generation of investigators requires that they're given the best tools, the best experiences, and understand that cross-disciplinary experiences are essential to being successful. That having quantitative skills, for example, to be applied in neurobiology is essential today. Having the wherewithal to develop an algorithm, write it into software and execute it on complex data, it gives you an advantage that historically students didn't have. And I think that's an important lesson because academic programs are often unilateral. They teach the student only computer science or only neuroscience or only cellular physiology. And I think it's important to walk across them because the brain doesn't have those divisions. The brain requires all of them. They need to have the tool set and they need to have the intellect and the creativity and inquisitiveness. And I think experiencing real-world investigation is the only way to obtain that. And the master's program at the Institute is one way to do that. I've been a scientist for a lot of years. I've been a neuroscientist my entire career, for 40 years. This is the most exciting time in my entire career. It truly is. And I think that is a result of a unique, perfect storm. A perfect storm in the technology, a perfect storm in the public's interest, a perfect storm in the questions that can be answered today that we couldn't answer before, a perfect storm in the willingness of academic centers to make commitments. So if I was a young person interested in anything, if you didn't go into this, I would question you. <laughs> because it's just so exciting every day. There's just something new happening. The pace of discovery is accelerating. And it's just a lot of fun.